we have a global audience joining us for today. So we're, uh, wherever you're joining us from, uh, I'm sending you our best uh, wishes. My name's uh, Paul. I'm the host today of the next in the uh, Admiral's Trading Spotlight Hot Topics uh, webinar series. And it's a uh, fascinating subject that we've got coming up today, but it's uh, fantastic for you to be here uh, uh, joining us today. Uh, and whether you're joining us here on uh, live on the Zoom call or whether you're watching this on YouTube where we're being uh, live streamed as well. You know, if you're watching on YouTube, then please, by all means, give us a like, be sure to subscribe, okay? Be sure to, to put your uh, questions and thoughts in the uh, in the comment box. So uh, today, what we're gonna talk about is we're gonna talk about the, uh, the shift in power from the uh, West to the East. Um, that is quite a, you know it's quite a large expansive subject as a fascinating subject we could speak for weeks on it uh, but actually we only have about 40 minutes but um, hopefully what we'll be doing is giving you just a little bit of a flavor a little bit of a taste and also more importantly okay for the traders here with us joining us today it's giving you a little bit of an idea of where you might be able to focus some attention uh, in order to sort of turn this from being a threat into uh, an opportunity but uh, as I said, you know it's uh, it's great for you all to be here. You know, here we here at Admirals, we appreciate that it's been a uh, it's been a rather eventful uh, last uh, twelve to fifteen months. Uh, you know, hasn't it? Uh, we appreciate you know, and we send uh, our best wishes to you all. You know, wherever you are in the world joining us, uh, we hope you're uh, we hope you're safe and healthy, and we hope that uh, you know you're starting to see the uh, at the end of the uh, the pandemic that we've been through, and that uh, hopefully his life is returning to a <laughs> to a, a sort of uh, normal for you all. As I said, uh, here at Admirals, we all send you. Our best wishes but um without uh, further ado let's uh, let's bring up the charts and have a uh, uh, have a little look at uh, and chat about our intended subject for today so just uh, bear with us a minute and we'll just bring that up here so just uh, hopefully uh, we'll be able to see that just uh, da, 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 here we go Excellent. Excellent. As I said, I hope that you can all still hear me. Hope you can all see me. Hope you can actually see the uh, the slides for today. And what we're going to talk about, as I said, is the shift in power from uh, west to east. Uh, and, you know, as the sub, sub, subtitle says there, what can we do to take advantage of this geopolitical uh, uh, shift? Um, great to see you here, Alexander. Vincenzo, fantastic as always to have you here. Okay, it's uh, um, always uh, interesting to have you know other uh, you know good people here on the on the call with us. Um, uh, you know, as I said, this is quite an expansive subject. Okay, and one that we could all have a, a particular uh, 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 opinion on, rightly or wrongly. And um, maybe there'll be people here in the room who think that there is no such thing as a shift in power from west to east. Maybe they'll see that actually, invariably, you know, the, the kind of the west is still keeping its uh, stranglehold on the world. Uh, you know, I'm uh, I'm here just to uh, give you some ideas and some thoughts and some insight, and it would be fascinating to hear your own. Uh, your own thoughts and views. As I said, I appreciate we have a global audience, right, who join us for our sessions here uh, from all four corners of the world, and you all have your own thoughts and uh, opinions on it, and it would be great to hear it. So if you're here with us in Zoom, you know, uh, put your comments and thoughts in the uh, Zoom chat box. Uh, and also, if, as I said, if you're watching this on YouTube, be sure to, to sort of put uh, in comments or questions, which my uh, uh, wonderful assistant, Anna, will be able to sort of uh, pass on to uh, myself. Or even if you have thoughts and considerations about topics you'd like to See us talk about in the future. Uh, we're always uh, uh, fascinated and enjoy the uh, that, that feedback um, um, from you. Okay. <laughs> so um, Alexander's made a couple of comments there and stuff, and uh, we will talk about that. You know, it's going to be uh, an interesting one. As I said, that uh, it's uh, it's a fascinating topic. Um, uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, or maybe just under, trying to understand, you know, who we are, uh, what you'll notice is that your Admiral Markets is now Admirals. As, as part of its 20th anniversary, uh, Admiral Markets is rebranding as Admirals. Um, for existing clients of, uh, of Admirals, it's not really going to be any noticeable difference other than a particular branding exercise. You'll still get all the help and support that you would normally. Uh, and you know, Admiral is a uh, an FX and CFD broker, okay, uh, with a uh, uh, you know a global reach and local support. Uh, they're licensed and regulated across a wide range of regulatory environments, uh, and they are providing competitive spreads, okay, on the most popular trading products, uh, and allow you to engage with markets uh, using both MT4 and MT5 and also Admiral's own Supreme Edition. Uh, if you've got any questions about Admiral's, please get in touch with your account representative uh, and they'll be very happy to help guide you. So what are we gonna talk about today? 
Well, um, as I said, uh, you know, we've, we've got 40 minutes, OK, for what is a, you know, a, a huge global thing that we could talk about for the rest of the week, really. But, you know, I'm going to touch on a little bit on about, you know, why have we seen the slide of the West? You know, uh, why have we seen the, the rise of China? We'll talk about the importance of Asian markets uh, and we'll talk a little bit about, you know, what is important about commodities, because, you know, I, I'm, I'm the first to admit, OK, you know, I, I, I love history, but, but I don't consider myself a historian. You know, I, I'm, I'm not an economist, I'm a trader. So I'm, you know, I'm going to be giving you a, uh, you know, a, a sliver of insight, okay? You know, a, a thin interest, you know, through the prism of looking at, you know, how can traders look at this, this geopolitical shift, okay? The, the kind of tectonic plates that are, are shifting geopolitically. And that will be the prism through which we're looking at is, you know, you know what can we look at and see and, and how is that already playing out in financial markets? And are there ways that we can turn that from, you know, from what will be a threat to uh, to an opportunity? For those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Paul. Um, you know, I've uh, traded for uh, many years, okay, for across uh, lots of different uh, vehicles and institutions. Uh, primarily, my own uh, view is uh, focused on trading FX indices commodities. For longer term trading, I'm a trend trader, and for shorter term trading, I'm a reversal or mean reversion trader. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's uh, think. I know there's a couple of comments in the uh, chat box already. That's fantastic. You know, it's, it's great. You know, I, I I don't you know I don't claim to be a, a world expert on this. I'm giving you my view as a uh, as a as a trader, and so I'm always fascinated to hear other people's opinions. And and there'll be people who are living, as I say, across you know various parts of the globe who will have their own thoughts and considerations um, about this particular. You know, as I said, this shift. Uh, you know, as the slide says there, you know, the, the COVID pandemic of 2020 helped accelerate a shift that was already occurring in kind of world powers shifting from from the west to the east so many people you know if you're sat there you know wherever you might be in the world you might think well you know why is that even important you know what well, you know it's it's too big it's you know it's too big a theme it's too big a concept to, to take on board as a, an individual why would it be even important to us but the reality is especially from a trading perspective is that there will be global impacts of these shifts, which we're already starting to see, okay, which we're already starting to see, and we'll look at the charts in a little bit, so be sure to stay with it all the way through so you can have a look at some of the charts. And this will, of course, create both threats and opportunities for traders. And, you know, part of that question is for you is, you know, do, do you want this to be a threat or an opportunity for you? Because actually, you know, for traders, you get the choice. All right. You get the choice that, you know, you can treat it as either as a threat or an opportunity. One of the ways you turn it into an opportunity is beginning to educate yourself about, you know, what is actually going on in the world and actually how that plays out in financial markets and actually how you're able to sort of utilize some of the, the tools and tactics and techniques and concepts that myself and my colleagues, Jens and Marcus have been sharing and how that actually, you know, you can bring that to play in your own uh, in your own engagement with financial markets. And so this webinar is going to investigate this phenomenon and discuss some of the coming opportunities for traders in 2021. OK, some of the moves have already uh, some of the moves have already uh, happened, uh, you know, but what we're seeing is will they continue and will there be an opportunity for us to uh, for us to join that? So where do we start here? OK, where do we start? OK, there's a, as I said, you know, this is a this is part of a huge global, uh, you know, a global tectonic shift that's occurring. You know, and, that, and the truth is, I can't I can't do it complete justice in, in the time we have. And also, you know, the kind of, you know, I'm a trader. Right. I'm, you know, I'm looking at it from the prism of being a trader. But, you know, here, here is my take. OK, and here is my view. And, and I gladly understand and, and take on board your own thoughts. OK. You know, um, if we go back, you know, back to almost just over 100 years ago, uh, it might be seen that the, the British Empire peaked in 1916. OK, uh, and after that, it's been in a period of decline. Uh, and as part of that decline, OK, you know, the British Empire is being, let's call it kind of the number one superpower that, that they were in the world. That was finally usurped by the kind of the upcoming American Empire. You know, firstly, during the end of the First World War, then the Second World War, but really you know, where it came home was during the Suez Crisis in 1956. Uh, and invariably, that is where the, the, both the, the UK and the French, OK, in, in collaborations, um, uh, basically decided to sort of retake the, the Suez Canal for themselves because of uh, issues that was going on with the NASA in uh, Egypt at the time. 
The Americans pull the rug, okay, financially from uh, underneath both the UK and uh, France, and basically establish themselves as the kind of number one superpower in the in the world. There, and for the last, you know, what's that, 50, 60 years, we have been living through that. But it might be said, okay, and and this would be a controversial um, uh, point, and people would differ on it. It might be said that the kind of the American power, the American empire, that that peaked in two thousand and one. And what we are now in is we're now into what the final stages or the fifth stage of the American power of what was kind of loosely termed as the SWCE, the Super Western Christian Empire, which has been running really since about 1400. As I said, this is a, a huge, bigger, broader sort of topic that could be discussed. And I'm sure there are you know people here joining us today or watching it who are uh, you know extremely well uh, <laughs> educated about the, the kind of uh, the historical elements of that. But we're just looking at it as how is it uh, how has it created the landscape we find ourselves in now? How is it how is you know how have we come to be in this place that we're playing out? The thing is, you see, when the British Empire peaked, uh, you know, although the American Empire overtook the British Empire, uh, they were they were allies. OK, there was you know, a great deal of, of shared history, shared values, etc. And, and so it was effectively, you know, it was almost like a passing of the baton okay, from the UK, uh, from the British to to the Americans. However, with America now in decline, it doesn't really have a, a friendly fellow super western christian empire neighbor to be able to pass the baton to so what that has happened and what's that occurred and that's what we're part of what we see now for the last 10 15 years is america's been forced to borrow to basically to maintain its power it's also been you know it's also engaged in let us say yeah sort of you know uh, uh, foreign and what might be deemed sort of kind of colonial adventures that have been a, an effort to effectively maintain its power and, and 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 regardless of the fact that america may be in decline or seen to be in decline militarily the, the americans are still by a very very long way you go they're kind of number one power in the uh, in the world how does that have an impact, okay, closer to home? Well, the European Union has sheltered under American power since World War II. Europe has always needed America to, to, to bail Europe out. The thing is, as America's power subsides, and that power can also be deemed to be just effectively, not only its military power, but its financial power. It might also be seen as it's kind of, let's say, it's, it's, it's political power, it's diplomatic power on the, on the global um, scheme. And whether, whether you're a, a fan of Mr. Trump or Mr. Biden, you know, neither of them, neither of them are really effectively sort of, you know, they are as part of managing that decline that we are, we are experiencing. But as I said, close to home, as a kind of as a as America sort of continues to sort of you know, withdraw from Europe, what we will see is perhaps the European Union starts to be pulled apart by external and internal influences, and it might be deemed that actually the Brexit happening in the UK leaving the European Union is the kind of first part of that fragmentation of of, uh, of Europe that we may well see over the uh, over the coming decades. And I suppose the question, but not, not only as traders, but as, as but as human beings, okay, as human beings, is you know, will it be a peaceful transition to Chinese power? And it'd be interesting because some people might say, well, actually, Paul, it's not going to happen. You know, there will not be the China's over overcoming uh, uh, overcoming Americans certainly in this century. And and if you may have that different view, I, I would be glad to hear it. Okay, be glad to hear. It. As I said, I don't claim to be the number one expert in the world in this. I'm giving you my view based on as uh, from my own personal experience and viewing it as a trader. But if we look at it on the, the flip side, OK, on the flip side, you know, where we've you know, just looked at how you know, the, the sort of West has been in decline and we tend to start to focus on, you know, part two in terms of where we're getting the focus on the East. It might be said, as I said, historians might say that this is not a new phenomenon. OK, and in fact, actually, the, the rise of China in particular it, it is actually it's, it's a second coming. Because 2000 odd years ago, China was leading the world then, okay, the, the sort of kind of the shining light of the world back then. And now what it might be said is that actually this is just, you know, this is returning, it's the second coming. But my view, as I said, a very simplistic view is that this began with, in 1979, with the uh, Chinese uh, president at the time, Deng Xiaoping. I hope I pronounced that uh, correctly. If I haven't, uh, my apologies. He created an open door policy. Okay, he, he recognized that there were issues in China, which um, you can read all about should you wish to. Uh, and he was one that started the open door policy and, and it began a hybridization of a Chinese socialist model and also the market economy. 
and you have to look at you know what has that achieved over the last say you know over the last kind of uh, 40 years or so well you know if you look at the kind of uh, the sort of the, the big numbers um, it managed to lift 800 million people out of poverty from 2017 it was creating two billionaires a week in china and uh, i think now actually and I could be wrong, but I think that um, China now has uh, has has more millionaires than than Europe. Okay, uh, life expectancy rose from as you can see there forty three point seven years in nineteen sixty to eighty years today, and by next year seventy six percent of China's urban population will uh, be classed as as middle class. So you know there has been in this you know this kind of um, uh, as part of Deng's uh, policy to, to open China and to like I said hybrid that model between Chinese socialist and market economies that just effectively you know is you know unleashed a kind of uh, that kind of Chinese engine that had been uh, restrained beforehand. And that has actually seen this, you know, absolute stunning rise in uh, in both China and also the kind of ripple effects that has had on other uh, Pacific nations, which we'll look at in a, in a little moment too. But as part of that, and as part of, you know, the bigger sort of under uh, underlying, uh, uh, certainly kind of financial um, engagement between the US and China, Ch China is now one of the biggest holders of, of US treasuries, okay? It's the biggest holder of US debt. It is in many ways, you might be seen to be, as you know, China is, is one of America's biggest banks, effectively, in the way that they effectively, um, you know, their, their, uh, their impact and influence on the dollar, uh, you know, through both their uh, collection of uh, treasuries and also the, the relationship in import and exports. And, and that is something that we have seen in particular over the last couple of, uh, last couple of years. Because over the last couple of years, as a, as a bit of a signal, as a shine of that shift in power is, you know, many of you will have seen if you've joined us for sessions in the past, is that effectively, you know, uh, uh, China and the US signed the first stage of a trade deal back in January 2020, which might seem like a lifetime ago now, you know, it's only a little over a year, but it has been a rather an eventful year for us all, hasn't it, ladies and gentlemen? Um, but it's effectively that kind of that trade deal in January 2020. And that was one of the, the key elements of the, you know, the, the sort of the Trump uh, administration, uh, him working with uh, President Xi, because what had happened is it had led to strained relationships and very tough negotiations over a, uh, over a couple of years. And there was a real... Um, kind of real will they won't they sort of you know vibe to to the, all of those negotiations for a while because there seemed to be bluff and counter bluff as, as both of these you know kind of like almost like two heavyweight boxers were were just effectively uh, testing each other out in the uh, in the boxing ring as, as part of the deal that what was supposed to be phase one uh, that deal committed china to to boosting purchase in manufacturing services and energy by by 200 billion over uh, two years uh, plus 50 billion worth of agricultural goods. So just keep those numbers in mind because we're going to look at how that has uh, has played out. All of which will have had an impact on commodities as we're about to look. Um, what is interesting is that I've no, mentioned this before is that um, uh, when President Biden won his uh, you know won his uh, uh, president election last November, uh, the kind of first initial official message from the Chinese Communist Party was congratulating him but also stating that the first priority was to renegotiate that trade deal. Okay. And you'd have to ask, well, why would they want to do that? Okay. You know, why would they, why would they be doing what, what happened there that effectively, you know, the, the Chinese might uh, wish to sort of change the, the, the terms of that deal. And, and we'll look at that over the next couple of slides. So as I said, you know, we're trying to sort of just, I'm just giving a very, 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 very high view, very broad brush element of it, because in fact, there's huge other elements that have uh, that have come out of that kind of shift in power from the West to the East. And what we've seen is basically, you know, Chinese influence starts to to creep into all areas of life, not, not only, you know, not only, uh, you know, in uh, sort of the Asia Pacific region, which we'll talk about in a few slides time, but also into into definitely into Africa, certainly into into Europe and into uh, into the US as well, even like the data we saw uh, earlier today is just showing that basically, you know, uh, uh, you know, the EU's biggest EU's biggest trading relationship is, is now with China. And invariably, that always has an impact, you know, that has an impact in terms of, you know, in terms of politics, which we will, which we'll look at a little bit later. But, you know, what we want to do is, you know, to look at, as I said, that kind of phase one of the trade deal uh, showed in an element of, you know, a, a focus on, uh, as I said, manufacturing services, energy and agricultural goods. And we want to take an interest as traders who will, right, how is that playing out? How is that all of that fitting into the, the kind of the, the bigger picture that we see? 
Um, and here's a, a chart that starts to give us a little bit of uh, insight. OK, and, uh, you know, we touched on this about uh, six weeks or so ago um, when we talked about, uh, you know, the kind of the commodity boom and you know, how it had particularly started. Uh, and this is a this is a you know, big picture overview of it. And this is the Thomson Reuters CRB index. It's, it's the kind of the price index of the futures for, for commodities. Th this is a monthly chart that I have here. OK, and let's bring up the old drawing tool here. OK, just, uh, uh, you know, we, we can see here that, uh, you know, that it peaked here. OK, peaked here in the summer of around about 2008. Um, uh, which, for those of you who are uh, old enough to remember, or you know, certainly been trading about it, that was effectively you know the peak of the summer before we saw the great financial crash and actually sort of price. You know, you can see their prices collapsed. Uh, we rallied up there into about 20, 2011, and for the most part, okay, for that kind of let's say for most of nine years after that, you can see for yourself that the prices of commodities were invariably just drifting down okay hopefully you can see that but what happened is you know we we bottomed out here okay we bottomed out here and when was that that was around march of last year okay the sort of the real bottom of the, the kind of covid crisis when the covid crisis hit you know and we you can see that in those prices of overall commodities that had actually collapsed but look where we are now okay and we can see for the last year Price of commodities, okay, has, has risen, all right, over the last, what would that be, last sort of uh, 13, 14, 15 months. And we've been at a point, okay, we would point out where, you know, we came to particular areas of, of, of trend lines uh, over the last month or so. And we were looking at, see, you know, the kind of what I'd look at and consider as, as an inflection point, all right, you know, a, a point at which the market is likely to make a decision whether to continue in its existing trend or to reverse. And that is always a good place for us to be doing our business as traders, like personally, in the way I, I would like to do it. But we can see already this this month, okay, you know, we've got a couple of days left to go for in April. Uh, but, you know, it looks like it'll be interesting to see if we kind of close above that trend line, above the kind of 200 level. That would just, you know, give confirmation that invariably, you know, that that sort of nine year, some might even say, some might even say 13, 14 year downtrend in commodities is, is being broken and that we're actually at the start of a kind of a, a new commodity run. And that kind of, you know, is is fueling, okay, that has been fueled over the last year of the, of the pandemic as we're about to look at, but also, you know, who is doing the majority of that buying? Okay, who is buying most of these commodities, and why? And we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about a little bit about that more uh, uh, more often in the in the next few minutes. Um, so uh, uh, Alexander there's joining us and said he mentions about the uh, the Belt Initiative and Africa's involvement in China tells another story for me. Uh, looking forward to learn what you think. And, um, and you're absolutely right there, Alexander. You know China's um, China's let's say its reach is you know its reach diplomatically and financially is uh, you know is ever increasing uh, but you know the Chinese military are are still you know they're still under par okay compared to compared to other you know, other major powers okay um, and that might change but that, that's something we will look at and, and talk about a little bit um, a little bit later but you talk about you know the belt initiative the uh, the belt road initiative you know effectively going from Effectively going from you know, um, you know Beijing to, to London is, is that actually how they would like to ha have it and consider it in terms of you know that kind of a, a Silk Road, the old Silk Road reemerging. All of that is part of all of that is part of you know, rising Eastern influence, which is effectively meaning Chinese influence. Okay, and that is something that we're going to look at and see over the uh, you know over the next uh, over the next few years. Okay. <clears throat> Um, so Alexander says, you know, China and the US are competing today, um, you know, by the way, from the markets at the moment, uh, and that's concerning him too. And, and yep, yeah, you'd be right, Alexander, it's something to, to certainly be concerned about, and it's certainly something to be aware of. It's certainly something that you want to, to understand, because, you know, as I said, these are the huge, big tectonic plates that are shifting at the moment, okay? And, and as I said, it can either be a threat or an opportunity, and, and hopefully this will provide a little bit of insight, just a little bit of a education about you know what uh, what's going on and actually how uh, uh, how the world is changing and what we you know how we can actually work with that so um uh, what we can also look at is here you know we talked about that phase one of the trade deal um basically also as part of that there was a commitment from uh, china to buy um soybeans uh, and once again, this is a chart, chart of uh, soybean futures. Uh, each candle is representative of a uh, of a month, okay, a month travel. Uh, and what you can see once again is that actually, you know, for about the you know, well, actually for about the last sort of uh, um, last ten years or so, okay, last five ten years, 
you know, those soybean prices have been collapsing. Okay. Uh, and then we had, you know, effectively, you know, a, a kind of a, a level of support you can see here. Okay. Around about 8,500 8, uh, until that changed. Okay. And that changed last year. And hopefully you can see there, you know, as I said, each, each candle is a, is a, a month there. Uh, and hopefully you can see that that is, you know, a, a huge rally, a huge rally in the price of soybeans, okay, which was part of, you know, the kind of the Chinese commitment, all right, as part of that phase one trade deal is actually buying soybeans. And you can see that that is, you know, an absolutely stunning run. And remember, that's a monthly chart. So if you were to go and find that and look at it on a, you know, weekly or daily chart, you, you know, you would see an even longer, bigger, stronger trend, okay, representation of it. But you can see for yourself, even this month, that is continuing and, you know, and we're back up excuse me, to, to levels not seen since about 2014, okay? So, you know, levels of nearly seven, eight years ago. That's where we're tapping. We're having a little bit of a break, but what interested to, to me is to seeing that, you know, can it actually, you know, get up and break up and close above these, okay? These be these kind of levels, 15,500 or so on a monthly basis. Well, well, then I start to see us, you know, sort of heading towards that kind of 18,000, you know, highs of the last last 10 to 12 years. So, you know, it, it, the, you know, in many ways, this, you know, this is an indication of the kind of the, the, the shift that we have been seeing. And it's an indication of, you know, the some of the kind of the absolute, um, uh, you know, the kind of absolute leverage, the absolute financial power that China has been bringing to the markets during a period of pandemic. Okay, remember when when invariably, you know, most um, most nations have just effectively, you know, retreated, withdrawn because invariably they're just dealing with uh, dealing with the pandemic, you know, dealing with issues on their own doorstep. That has allowed, you know, um, China to, to basically to sort of, um, you know, uh, operate very, very, uh, very uh, effectively to leverage their, their strengths and their skills. OK, in these commodities markets, to, you know, in to 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 uh, in their own best interests. Uh, and that follows through to another element, copper. OK, here's a commodity. This is copper. This is once again, this is a chart of copper futures. This is a monthly chart. Each candle represents a, uh, a month. And uh, once again, you know, it's a story that, you know, that we sort of looked at with the CRB and with soybeans is that, you know, we, we had highs here around about two, 2011, OK, up around about four, 4.6. 4.62 uh, and we dropped all the way down to two okay back in 2016 and then what we had here okay is that you know this was the covid crash here tapped back down to two uh, and then what you can see there is the price is reversed there and we've effectively gone from from two dollars up above four dollars okay you know that's kind of doubled there in the last year and you can see for yourself what's gone on there and, and we're now getting up here back to these kind of 2011 highs all right and, and i think it, it could be wrong but i think earlier this week you know we, we hit highs that we've not really seen for for kind of about nine years okay and then as you can see for yourself there okay that's 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 where we're going and i and i wouldn't surprise us to basically be looking at that so you know so clearly that has, you know, uh, you know, if, if you've been a, an investor or a buyer of not only commodities but also in particular copper, well, it's been a fantastic year for you, okay. And it, you know, would be thinking, well, you know, that's great, Paul, but where do we go from here? Uh, personally, you know, there's a case of what I suspect we will see is that there's going to be pent up demand because effectively, not only we have we not been mining at the kind of levels that we would have been normally because of because of a pandemic, but also there's pent up demand. Okay, so there's there's going to be a case of the effect of we've got a little bit of a pent up supply, uh, but also pent up demand. Okay, as as the nations and economies come back online full time and start to start to gear themselves up, and and so you know you'd be looking at to expect that that effectively that would be a a, a trend that we'd expect to continue. But once again, you know what we can see is that you know the kind of biggest purchase of that has been the Chinese, and in fact they've been able to steal a march on everybody by uh, you know. But if they're buying down at uh, two and two and a half, okay, you know, not only have they done well, but are also the they're ahead of that kind of that increased price um, curve that we can uh, that you can see for uh, uh, there. But then it starts becoming input. Well, how does that affect us, Paul? You know, what what are our options? Okay, how can we you know how can we play that? Well. Where does the vast majority of the copper come from? Well, a lot of that copper comes from uh, Australia. Uh, Australia, and invariably, you know, if the Chinese are basically 
fact, you know, they literally for the last 20 years have been buying the vast majority of raw materials that are pulled out of the ground, the hard commodities out of Australia. Well, then invariably, most of them have been shipped to, towards that. It's kind of uh, the, uh, the sort of rapacious needs of the, uh, of the Chinese uh, economy. And of course, that has a reflection in the Australian dollar. You know, effectively, they need to pay for that copper in some way. OK, but both, uh, you know, in terms of Australian dollars. And we can see here. Last year, you know, price in Australian dollars, we had a real dip down there at the start of the uh, COVID crisis. But you can see for yourself there, OK, you know, the, this is against the Aussie against the US dollar down to kind of 55 area. But you can see for yourself, all right, for last year, OK, up until that sort of February this year, you know, we went from 55 to 80. All right. That's just, you know, that's a big two and a half thousand pip move, OK, over in a year over uh, on the Australian dollar. And that's one thing we saw. And. For those of you who are completely new to trading, what we'll often quite often see is that you know the Australian dollar is used almost as like a proxy for China. Okay, there's not many people trading the Chinese yuan. That may well change as we get a shift, but generally, what most most operatives in the FX markets they will use the Australian dollar as a proxy. Okay, for China. So when we see that there is that kind of a you know risk on mentality, when we see that you know the kind of a Chinese economy is uh, booming, when we see there is a huge demand for commodities. It's not unsurprising that we have seen, you know, that surge also represented in the Australian dollar as well. And so that might be, you know, a, a simpler and easier way for some traders to, to be able to, to monitor this and watch it by actually just keeping an eye on the you know, Chinese economy, but also how that reflects in the uh, Australian, um, or the, both the Australian economy, but in particular, the, uh, the Australian dollar. And further along that, OK, you know, one of the other ways to look at that is, you know, another currency, OK, the Aussie against the Japanese yen. Uh, the Aussie against the Japanese yen is used, as I said, you know, as kind of a, a, a proxy for risk, OK, a proxy for risk. When we have a risk on mentality, the Australian dollar tends to rise. When we have a risk off mentality in markets, the Japanese yen starts to, to rise. There's also uh, effectively a, uh, um, you know, and kind of another layer to this that, as I said earlier, the Australian dollar is quite often used as a proxy for China, uh, but equally also. So then invariably, you, you know, you have a, in many ways, you kind of a little bit of a proxy for the trade between China and Japan. OK, remember, you know, the you, you have both um, you have both a political element. Uh, you also have a financial element in terms of the, the kind of leverage and power between both, you know, the Chinese uh, uh, China and its economy and also the Japanese and economy. They're both fighting over a. Uh, uh, they're both export driven markets and they're both sort of fighting over very similar uh, export markets. And so invariably that has uh, that causes friction between the Chinese and the Japanese. Uh, there is also historical friction there between the Chinese and the, uh, the Japanese going back to uh, around about 1937, which outside the remit of today's session. But invariably, you know, that is that's remembered. OK, that's um, that's still that still plays in the minds of both the, uh, the Chinese and the Japanese. And so what you have there is, you know, two very close neighbors kind of butting head up butting heads causing friction there and and we'll touch on that a little bit later in terms of you know how we can see that impacting us but you know as i said for traders looking at this australia against the japanese yen this is the monthly chart this as i said can be a, a great proxy for understanding okay you know where where we see um uh, that risk on mentality both globally but also you know a, a reflection of uh, how well china's doing and, and in this particular case you know, uh, as I said, a bit like the Aussie dollar, you know, at the start of the COVID crash, okay, the prices dropped very, very, very strongly. Why was that? Because China was the, you know, the kind of the first nation that um, that uh, endured, okay, um, the, uh, the the kind of COVID pandemic and invariably, okay, you know, the, the Chinese stock market dropped, which also meant that effectively cut off demand for commodities and this effectively, you know, had an impact on the Australian dollar and also it being a risk off mentality, you know, the price dropped. But then from March, sort of time of last year, so you know, 12, 13 months ago, you can see for yourself that that has swung and has changed, all right? And so there's been a risk on mentality. And there's also effectively, as we said earlier, you know, uh, China basically, you know, uh, buying, buying, you know, uh, Amer Australian commodities at cheap prices. That's what they've been uh, looking to uh, sort of uh, um, make the most of. Uh, uh, you know, an, another way to, to look at that is, you know, you could have a look at this, and this is on the uh, Admiral Markets platform, is ASX, which is the ASX 200, which is the main Australian stock index. So once again, there's kind of a, there's a double element to it in the sense that uh, what we're seeing is that, uh, you know, it's, a, it's an indication of Australia's uh, strength 
it is a small proxy for uh, uh, for uh, risk on. It's also a proxy for uh, China, uh, you know, and it, it, it's just a uh, also you know it kind of because it's a very commodity. Um, heavy uh, index. It also a, a reflection of uh, a reflection of you know the kind of demand for uh, commodities. Uh, and once again, as you can say, this this is a monthly chart. Uh, you can see for yourself there. Uh, you know, from the start of 2020 in those two months, okay, to the end of you know, March, there, you know, prices dropped there. What was that about? Down to around about kind of 4,400. But you can see that that has reversed, and and here we are up above seven thousand, okay, and, and and continuing to go. So all of this is giving us an indication that you know the there is there is that kind of risk on mentality certainly in uh, in the uh, in the east. There is also certainly that demand for commodities, okay, the sort of you know pent up demand is coming from the east. These are the major buyers. This is where the action is. Whereas both the effect you might say the US, the UK, and Europe were, were effectively skittled over a, a year or so ago. Go, um, by the COVID and, and still continue to, to deal with it, uh, and so that's that's probably a that's probably a, you know a, a longer, deeper conversation outside the remit of here. But hopefully the charts are already showing us the way the world is going. Okay, the where you know where the actually the focus is this last uh, sort of uh, twelve months since we've uh, been dealing with uh, COVID. Um, uh, you know, we looked at uh, Australia Japanese uh, yen earlier, and you know, one of the other ways you can look at it is also the kind of the Japanese Nikkei. Okay, the uh, Nikkei, their their main index, uh, and what we can, well, this is once again is a monthly chart. You know, and effectively, it, we saw just one second is you know we saw once again the kind of COVID crash followed by okay what has been a particularly strong end towards the uh, the year. And that is mostly, you know, that's mostly is a case of, you know, here, this, I'll, I'll bet this is November, okay, 2020. A lot of that is actually to do with, you know, that was the announcement of the uh, the first of the vaccines, okay, were, were available. Uh, and that with that, okay, um, countries and economies would start to open up. And, and actually, that would be good for our business. And, and we've seen that. Interesting thing to, to look for yourself at the moment, just keep an eye on the monthly chart there is, is that, you know, that is now tightening up. OK, those are indecision candles that we're seeing there. OK, so, you know, just it, it is is that the Nikkei taking a breather? OK, uh, is it taking a breather before we get a next move up? All right. Or is it, you know, we take a breather before we get a next move down. And part of that is an indication of the Japanese yen. OK, if you know it, what you will find is very often with you know Japan being such a, a, a strong export economy. OK, uh, is effectively is, you know, as the, as the Japanese yen strengthens, well, then invariably the Nikkei uh, weakens because they're, they're com the companies on the index who export their exports suddenly become more expensive and, and vice versa. Okay. As the yen weakens, okay, that tends to be good for uh, Japanese companies. And so very that means the Nikkei rises. And, and once again, this might be a way for you to, to sort of engage with uh, this theme of, you know, of increasing sort of a uh, uh, power leverage um, in uh, across in the sort of the, in the Pacific and the East uh, by being able to sort of trade both the yen and the, uh, uh, and the Nikkei it, itself, both of which are available on the uh, Admiral's platforms. Um, and you know, whilst we're here, you know, we might as well actually have a little look at the kind of uh, Chinese stock market. Now, this is the Chinese A50 stock market. So this is the kind of uh, um, 50, 50 stocks that are allowed to have uh, kind of Western involvement. OK, you, the West are allowed to you are allowed to to buy shares in these particular companies. OK, it is not the same as as the other kind of main uh, Chinese stock index. This is one that let's say, you know, Western uh, financial institutions would would watch and, and look to, to involve them. And it, so it is a it is a small proxy into it, into China itself. But the kind of thing that always interested me for me for here was that, you know, for about since about 2015, last six, seven years, you know, it was in what traders might describe as either an ascending triangle, OK, an ascending wedge. Kind of what was interesting to me is, you know, if we look at the that was the COVID crash we had there. OK, which was, you know, not not terribly deep. You know, if we look, we've just looked at what we look at. We looked at Nikkei, we looked at uh, ASX, we looked at other commodities. OK, we looked at uh, uh, Australian dollars. OK, and we can see that invariably there was huge moves there. OK, but, you know, actually, strangely enough, in the A50, the, the move wasn't, um, you know, wasn't a, it wasn't a terribly sharp sell -off. not as sharp a sell -off as many people would expect. Maybe you have a view on that. Maybe you have an opinion on why you thought that might happen. 
But what you can see is that, you know, that March, it turned around and actually, you know, we pushed our way up to uh, 20,000 there, okay, at the start of this year. We've come off there a little bit, okay, and, you know, there's, there's going to be uh, elements towards that. But clearly, you know, that clearly the, there is there is strength there, okay, and you'll be watching to see how that plays out for the next couple of months. But invariably, you know, if you if you want sort of direct exposure, all right, to uh, to China, well, then you're going to be looking at something like um, the uh, the A50 market or, or an ETF that uh, that replicates uh, that. And if you want to know more about ETFs, my, my colleagues Jens put in a, a couple of uh, I did a couple of great sessions earlier in the Trading Spotlight archive, just looking at ETFs um, themselves. So, you know, hopefully you're getting a picture of, you know, what we've seen over this last year, okay, in terms of it's just accelerated a shift towards the uh, the East. And, you know, a lot of that is to do with traders' risk profile, okay? You know, some traders would be very, very happy to, to you know, directly trade commodities, okay, or actively trade things like the Chinese A50 index, okay, or the Nikkei. But others may not particularly be of that risk profile, and that's absolutely fine. You know, as, as, a, as a trading point, as a teaching point that we talk about to, to most traders, I always say, you know, you need to trade in line with your own personality and beliefs, okay? We, we all sit on the risk spectrum, okay? Some people are very risk accepting, some people are very risk averse, okay? It's about knowing where you sit on there, okay? And, and having rules and plans, okay, that that help you with that and don't don't cause you with uh, any uh, any sort of uh, distress and one way that you can be seen is you know we've just looked at the uh, you know the kind of the those booming commodities well you know sometimes you have to think about what the second and third and fourth order of consequences of these events are uh, and this is a fantastic example of it so this is the weekly share price of caterpillar okay caterpillar a big you know big engineering company they make you know big trucks big diggers okay the kind of things you you need lots of if you are going to be uh, if you're going to be digging you know digging commodities out of the ground all right if you want to be digging lots of uh, of you know of uh, copper and uh, uranium and platinum and palladium and gold etc well you're going to need a lot of you're going to need a lot of diggers and you need a lot of trucks uh, which basically is completely and utterly reflected in the demand here for for caterpillar trucks and you know this is i mean it's a beautiful chart really this is a weekly chart but you know you have there the covid crash which became a really lovely double bottom there okay a little double bottom one two three uh, and you know having that price been down at the very low okay at the low covid around about just under 90 around about 88 dollars well you can see for yourself can't you ladies and gentlemen over the last year okay it's effectively you know that price has gone from 88 dollars up to $230, all right? It's just, uh, you know, during the pandemic, what lots of uh, trading institutions, financial institutions, they a lot of them have focused on the kind of the fangs, okay? The kind of online tech companies, okay? Apple, Amazon, all right? Netflix, Peloton, et cetera. And, and all of which were supreme movers during that period. But equally, okay, what maybe flew under the radar a little bit was, you know, people wanting to people wanting to get their hands on commodities, people needing diggers, all right, to, to get stuff out of the ground. Okay. As as fancy schmancy as people like to look at as the kind of uh, let's say the kind of uh, US tech companies, the reality is none of that, none of that happens, okay, without people pulling the actual commodities and stuff out of the ground. We need to to, to build that. And so as I said, you know, your risk profile might not be that you wish to sort of engage, okay, with uh, you know, directly into either the indices or the commodities, but this might be a way that actually for you to sort of, you know, be involved in that shift, to be involved in that play, but actually at a, let's say at a more, uh, at a more sedate pace, okay, at a less volatile pace. And, you know, I'd be looking at their Caterpillar on the weekly, I'd be looking there, okay, saying, well, all right, that is actually, that's kind of coiling up there at the moment, coiling up there around about 230 $230. Now you're gonna be starting to think, right, well, it's taking a breather what's going to happen next okay is it a case of this is a breather before we get a next move up and if we start to see not only european and the eastern but also western as these economies you know reopen and demand okay comes back into the market well i could i could see the you know being increased demand for caterpillar um, uh, products or if you know there is a, a particular next wave okay of a particular wave of covid or uh, or, or a virus of some sort you know will that 
clamp down on on the uh, uh, you know on effectively the the kind of the commodity boom, but also the kind of companies and economies and uh, uh, countries and whole regions coming out, okay, and, and changing. So it, it's it's it is for me. It's at a bit of an inflection point there. Okay, there's a bit of a decision point there. So I would keep an eye on that, but that might well be the possibility to you know to sort of buy on a pullback for a, a kind of a longer term move. So, um, you know, hopefully that's just as I said, giving you a little bit of an indication of, of what we have uh, what we have seen. And, and you know, as I said, th this kind of trend has been going on for about 20 years, but actually the kind of those shifts were accelerated by the COVID pandemic. And hopefully you can have seen from those those particular charts that we've just looked at how quickly that shift has, uh, has occurred. You know, and as other elements, what we saw is that it, during 2020, I think is the kind of final quarter of 2020, uh, we saw the combined GDP, okay, gross domestic product of the East, uh, overcome the West's combined GDP for the for the first time. I mean, that is a that's a significant shift, ladies and gentlemen. Right, that's a significant shift. Okay, uh, and not only that, the COVID pandemic it accelerated China's date for overtaking the USA uh, as the number one economy. Previously, economists had thought it would happen occur around about 2035. But they think this that what's gone on in the last year has brought it forward to 2028. You know, it's accelerated it by seven years. I mean, that's only that's only seven years a year as as year as away, uh, seven years away. It, it's also caused consternation with with you know within kind of for example like New Zealand. Uh, we saw earlier this week, okay, um, New Zealand's ruling their party coming out and, and talking about actually how. Um, they had been a part of what's known as the the kind of Five Eyes Partnership, which is effectively US, um, the US, the the UK, Australia, uh, New Zealand, Canada, uh, kind of English speaking Anglo Saxon kind of uh, nations, uh, and actually how New Zealand now was 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 is kind of <clears throat> not choosing to sort of deal with China um, through the kind of through the prism of the kind of Five Eyes Partnership, but invariably is actually is turning and shifting its focus towards uh, New Zealand, and this is also being seen in Australia as a kind of as Chinese money has has flooded into to both you know Australia and New Zealand it's not unsurprising that those kind of nations might start to sort of turn and drift away from the uh, the US uh, and and focus more on you know their biggest trading part New Zealand's biggest trading partner is China okay and so they're not going to do anything to to to, to change that or under underwhelm that okay and so that will cause further consternation to, to both you know the both the Americans and the West itself and you know, and on a longer term spree well you know it, it is possible although you might not think it right this moment based on the, the 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 terrible things going on in India is that it could be true that India will replace the US as the number two economy by by 2050 and you know that's just as I say that gradual shift okay the gradual shift towards the uh, the east you know and, and it's it, it's likely to continue. You know, but with regards to that, kind of just to make a couple of final points is that, uh, you know, that, that rise of China, as I said, had, had spilled out into the entire Pacific area. OK, and, you know, we have seen we've seen the entire Asian region lifted. OK, you know, yes, China has been the main party. China is the the kind of the, the main player on the stage. China is where the focus is. But actually, this had a huge impact you know, from nations, you know, Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, et cetera, you know, Philippines. It has had a, a huge impact. And, and there's nothing really to see that changing. OK. But you know, as always, the, the, there are always teething problems. Okay, you know, with the, with the, any kind of growing uh, organism, and you have to think of well, what are the possible problems that you know could stop that, or could could you know be like a kind of a spanner in the works? Um, there is always the, the the view of you know the people might talk that the Chinese economy would overheat. One of the challenges that China has is that is that invariably is that its its economy, its stock market, its main stock market, it is seen as rather opaque. Okay, it's not doesn't have the transparency that you get in in Western uh, economies, which effectively is is a double edged sword. It does allow China to uh, to operate as they please, but, but equally it means that you know uh, it, you know Western nations are are. Uh, hesitant, okay, hesitant to to fully invest and fully commit to China, because of that that kind of opaque. There's also some internal issues that undoubtedly you've seen. You know, we, we see with the Uyghurs and also with uh, Hong Kong. You know that that these play issues are playing out, okay, and and they they are playing out on, on global media as well. And also, of course, fallout from, you know, the kind of Chinese co the COVID pandemic and, you know, how that started and how that came around. And, and, I, and I don't think really nations have, have really truly got to, to grips with that. 
There is also, as I said, some growing pains because there's friction with neighbours. Okay, you know, um, we've all you have all grown up. You know, we've all grown, you know, grew up in a house. There's always friction with some neighbours. Okay, regardless of uh, regardless of your best intentions. And you know, we've alluded to a little bit. Okay, you know, there's been friction with uh, with Japan. There's also been friction with India, which has spilled over into uh, some you know kind of let's say low key fisticuffs there on the uh, on the borders that they uh, they share. Uh, the, one of the main elements is Taiwan, and, and I think that Taiwan will be the element that um, basically either continues that accelerations or puts it in check. And what I mean by that is that, you know, with the uh, uh, election of Mr. Biden, okay, in into the U.S., uh, China might well see that this is, you know, is a, is a weak president, a lamed up president that are. Uh, gives them the sort of encouragement to basically to, to return Taiwan to the fold because they believe that America wouldn't, wouldn't step in. There's also some element of friction in Australia. Australia is an interesting, their relationship with China is, is quite interesting. Namely, you know, as I said, China has been their, you know, main export partner in terms of, you know, basically buying all of the, the commodities that come out of their ground. That Chinese money has kind of uh, fed into all parts and aspects of uh, Australian life. Um, but equally also there is a, there is a kind of, a, let's say, a, a difference in values that means that, um, that there can sometimes be friction between the Australians and the, uh, and the Chinese uh, as well. So uh, in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, you know, the, the kind of Asian Pacific region overtook the West in terms of combined GDP last year. That's a, that's a significant, you know, it's a significant note, you know, footnote. But it's just an example of the shift in power and finance from the West to the East, not militarily, but the Chinese are working on that. And that is a, a separate uh, presentation. And really what we saw is the COVID pandemic has accelerated this particular trend. And that's going to be a trend that continues for the remainder of this century, probably for the most likely. And that shift has already started seeing manifesting itself in commodities prices, which we looked at earlier. If you're unable to trade or invest in the commodities, then you may wish to track companies that are supplying the machinery to power this particular boom, this particular shift. So we've looked at like Caterpillar. There will be friction points. And a lot of that will depend upon how China navigates them. Okay, China is a different China is a different kettle of fish than the way the U.S. Okay, would uh, would deal with their issues on an international stage, and how China deals with them is is going to be very telling in terms of actually the kind of the uh, the pace and acceleration of the uh, of the rise of the East over the West. So um, uh, I hope you found that useful. Don't forget to join us next time, okay? So uh, you can join us same time on Friday where my colleague Jens is going to talk about his top three FX trading indicators, including the MACD, Slow Stochastic, Parabolic SAR, and how he combines them both. That's Friday 30th of April, 2 o'clock London time. Check your inbox for the, the webinar link. So if you wish to contact us, if you've got questions or thoughts, you can do email global at admiralmarkets.com, youtube.com forward slash admiralmarkets. Go there to watch both this, the recording this and a wealth of other resources or facebook.com forward slash admiralmarketsglobal. Well, um, I hope you found that useful, ladies and gentlemen. As always, we've uh, run over time just a little bit, for which I uh, apologise. But as I said, this you know, it's a, it's an absolutely huge. It's a, it's a huge topic that we could talk about for days and weeks and months and years about again, and we probably will be talking about it in years to, to come. But hopefully, that's just given you a very, you know, a very thin sliver of insight into what's going on and how we can turn that into an opportunity for uh, ourselves. Uh, as always, you know, as I said, if you're watching this on YouTube and you found this useful, please, you know, by all means, give us a like. Be sure to subscribe to our uh, YouTube channel. If you've got questions or comments or thoughts for other things you'd like us to, to cover, by all means, put it in the comments box and we will be sure to pick up on that. As always, I wish you the very best of success in your own trading, ladies and gentlemen. I look forward to speaking to you soon. Trade well.